And so it is, it is my pleasure to, to welcome Pia. Um, could you introduce yourself just very quickly who yes. you are and, and what you're going to talk about yeah. today? Yeah. So, welcome uh, also from my side. Um, I'm Pia Hanfeld. I'm currently uh, a master's student at, at Casus in the Department of Autonomous Vehicles. And uh, today, I want to talk to you um, or present you the very interesting paper, Adversarial Policies Attacking Deep Reinforcement Learning, because it's one thing that I've come across uh, during my research for my master's thesis, and I found, found this um, paper very interesting. But at first, and to understand what this paper is all about, I'm going to introduce you um, a little bit at least to some concepts of uh, which this paper um, covers. So at first, we're going to dive into um, a bit of reinforcement learning. Um, as you might know, reinforcement learning is also a technique to uh, train um, to train uh, animals uh, to uh, solve certain tasks, uh, like uh, my, uh, like mice running through a maze, uh, finding cheese, and uh, avoiding hitting dangerous tires. And it can also be applied to neural nets, uh, such that they um, learn to solve a task on their own simply by trial and error. This sounds very simple, but it isn't actually because it depends on various things uh, like choosing um, how to how to choose an action actually, and determining what is bad behavior and what is good behavior. In so the, the baseline is that every reinforcement learning project can be boiled down uh, to a so-called Markov decision uh, process, which is demonstrated in the sketch. Um, we have our agent, which is our neural net, calculating some sort of output, which is going to be the action applied to our environment. The environment changes and um, rewards our agent and the agent tries to maximize this reward over time and also by by changing and the environment gives back a new state which is then a new input for our neural net and it's the great cycle of learning um, how to solve tasks in the reinforcement learning um, there's another um, thing that's called policy. The policy is the way that our agent behaves uh, during a given time. And it maps the states, um, the, the states we receive from our environment to probabilities of selecting um, each possible action. So mathematically speaking, we have a policy P. Um, and it's uh, mapping all the action times the states and gives back values between one and zero. So simple uh, probabilities. If the agent follows the policy at a time t, then it ensures that the uh, probability um, p a over s is the probability uh, that a t um, is a if s t is s, so that um, our action is really the best action possible for a certain state. And there are many methods in RL um, to um, change the policy over time. Um, so that our experience um, gets the best or is nearly perfect. And one of these methods is uh, called Q-learning. And uh, because I'm building a project on my own um, implementing Q-learning, I can um, 
show you a bit what it's all about. So Q stands for quality. And our main goal is to find uh, the action with the highest reward for each state. So thinking back um, or looking back at our maze from the beginning, we have two networks. One networks and uh, one network um, simply looks at the state it gets from the environment, and then um, tries to sum the reward for every possible action. So it goes through the whole. It explores the whole state and sums up every reward for every action and stores it in a table called Q table. And this is basically a cheat sheet for a certain state, which is perfect because then we have our policy net performing at the beginning of the learning um, schedule a random action. And this random action differs quite highly from the perfect solution given by our cheat sheet. So we can calculate a loss, which is then back propagated through the network to update our neurons. And um, as time goes by, we update our policy net and the policy net uh, doesn't perform random actions anymore. Um, it chooses on its own and um, enhances, enhances itself by its own uh, agent and shows. And the cheat, sheet, uh, the, the cheat sheet net is only updated at certain epochs. The next thing I want to talk about is adversarial Texas, which is um, explained very brief, uh, briefly. We have on the left our image of a panda. And we as humans, for us, it's clearly to see that the left image is a panda, but our uh, computer vision net is only about 60% sure that it is. But it classifies it correctly at least. And then we add random noise to the picture. Um, and now our net classifies our pretty panda to be a given, which is something completely different. And humans can determine if the picture is altered or not. But still, this attack works. And there's another paper, but this is not the time to delve into it. Um, I could also do another talk about it, which says that adversarials um, are no bugs, they are features. Because in this random noise, there are patterns hidden which generalize over many data sets. And this could actually help us in um, making our nets more robust in the future. So just to give you a little view on what is actually happening in adversarial text. So now we're finally getting to the content of the paper I want to cover. The baseline was, um, the problem is, uh, that in reality, um, there won't be, um, there will be people around, for example, cars, um, who do things that aren't very predictable and could also be adversary to our car, with, uh, to the neural net inside of the car deciding what to do. So the baseline was they were letting two um, trained policies play against each other in soccer. Now we will, I will show you, show you the video, how this looks like. Which is also kind of interesting. And for me, it's baffling to see how you can train two mannequins uh, to play a game. They are aware of their joints, they are aware of their um, limbs, of the velocity they move in, um, of the ball and their goal, and their opponents. So yeah, this is pretty cool. 
I missed that one. So you call them adversarial policies. So what makes it adversarial in this case? We will come to that. Oh. Yeah, these two are normal uh, okay. policies playing against each other. Okay. Yeah. So, and as I said, um, there will be something unpredictable in reality happening. And most of the time, at least if not somebody gained access to the car via hacking it, they won't manipulate the pixels of the input images. Um, what happens if our self-driving cars see something it has never seen before, like a pedestrian slipping and falling to the ground, or fancy car accessories, or something completely unpredictable, like in the case of the Tesla Model 3, like two weeks ago, which um, crashed into an uh, a truck laying on its side um, with full speed. So, if we could implement something that is physically possible and natural looking to the training algorithm, we could then make our nets more robust and apply it to um, more real-world problems. So Cleve et al. were able to show that this is actually possible. They trained uh, an, an agent to be adversary to the victim, the blue one. You see that it falls to the ground and twitches. And the victim clearly um, <coughs> The victim is clearly influenced by its vision and the state of the opponent. So it simply trips over. And that's when the opponent wins. Okay. Why does it win? Because um, the victim is uh, dependent of its visions and it's, it's influenced by it. And because the victim never saw something happening like this before, it doesn't know what to do. Oh, okay. And the probabilities for the moving of the limbs is something that is not working. Okay. So somehow it creates an unknown state for yes. the victim. Yes. And not only an unknown state, it's physically possible and it's natural, just like a pedestrian waving or slipping. Yeah. And that's something new that they introduced. And somehow, so both networks know about the positions, I guess, of the other two. Yes. And thus, state that manipulates, you can add adversary attacks where you can impose something yes. in the red, in your opponent, in this case, that causes... Yeah, and it learns to be this way on its own because it's an, a reinforcement learning agent. Um, so it was never told how to, to be adversary, it learned it on itself. And... Um, Maybe you could think that you can achieve the same um, the same result, result by simply letting the opponent fall to the ground or do something random. But um, they also tested that, and you can watch the videos here. So in this case. Um, The opponent uh, performs random actions and still the victim performs quite well. It, not as usual, but it doesn't fall over um, as much, it doesn't twitch as much um, and it still scores. Also with the opponent performing zero action, the victim is actually quite
quite good. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you see that the um, adversary uh, adversarial policy clearly has a different impact on the victim. So how did they find this is adversarial policy? Yeah. How does the point know that this has to be? It learns it by itself. Okay. Yeah, it's reinforcement learning is a very big black box, and um, only by um, looking at the neurons themselves and making their activations visible, you can maybe see what does uh, or what activates them the most. But yeah, it's a very big black box. Can you say something in terms of the policy? So is it it's trying to optimize yes. something? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what this is. Here. And it's just the, um, getting a higher reward. So it does everything it can to get a higher reward. Yeah. Okay. So to sum everything up, uh, we can see that the victim agent uh, can be successfully manipulated through its vision. They can reliably and reliably beat the victim with only 3% um, as many time steps of training as for the uh, victim policies. Um, so it's very fast to train an adversarial policy, which is good. And um, the adversarial agent learns to beat the victim not by be becoming a very strong opponent, but by simply falling to the ground and twitching. Mm -hmm. And is that something that was imposed so that you could, was the, for example, in the opponent, did they impose some kind of random noise to, to beat the victim, or is it something it, it learned? Mm. Um, they usually start from random actions okay. and then through back propagation they become better in choosing their own actions. So maybe the, the falling they learn from just randomly falling to the ground mm -hmm. and then afterwards they develop their own methods and on twitching. Yes. So you could control better by imposing certain boundary conditions, let's say, by not letting it fall, you could maybe you could kind of control the direction how it works. Is that, is um, that true? Can you say that? Or? I don't know if you can really control learning and reinforcement learning. I mean, you can um, punish certain behavior, but um, in this environment, the only punishment is if your opponent scores. Mm -hmm. Or the opponent falling is a reward? Uh, yeah, the opponent falling and not being score. able to score is a reward. Yeah. I have a very basic question. If you said back propagation, um, this, does, does this mean I, it builds the gradient of the error? Yes. And then it does gradient descent and optimizes. Yes. So, okay, not the back propagation, just the. No, no, um, you back propagate your, um, your loss through the network and you have an optimizer performing okay. search. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So, what should we do about it? Um, the first thing that comes to the, mi uh, to, to the minds of the, of the paper um, writers was um, masking the victim agents. And this did, in fact, work. Sorry. Um, it did work. OK. Um, so they masked the victims such that they weren't aware of their opponent anymore. And you can see that the victim scores. By being masked, so not influenced by its opponent, simply runs and finishes 
and scores, which but, is good. Um, but it's just, kind of random that if it scores or not, right? Um, it's random. Yeah, depending on the on the action the the, the adversarial policy does. So in this case, it only falls to the ground. But if it try to um, to tackle the, the victim over, then it would be quite difficult, I think. How does it learn in this case? Because it does, it's masked from. It doesn't learn. It so doesn't. the victim doesn't learn in this scenario. And also, this is not practical in the real world because if we mask our autonomously driving cars, then <laughs> chaos will come mm -hmm. upon us. Um, so what they proposed um, was uh, to fine tune the victim's policy, which is the basic thing you do with your neural nets. You always have to fine tune hyperparameters and um, hope for a good RNG such that your networks perform very well. But um, in this case, uh, it was um, possible to show that the attacker still succeeded, but it helped to adjust, um, which is quite good concerning that we can upscale this whole fine tuning um, by multiple and uh, various learning um, epochs. And you see it quite well in this example. So these are all, um, so at the very left, you can see the very first version of the adversarial policy and the normal policy. Um, in the middle, you can see the um, the already trained adversaries and the victim policy. And on the right, you see the finally trained version. So um, on the very left, the opponent wins almost every time. In the middle, it's getting a bit difficult because the victim was already trained and knows how to um, know how to um, defend against the adverse and against the adversarial. And on the very right, you can see that the victim also tries to trip his opponent over. Yeah. And it's so interesting to see how, how they learn it on their own because they are still machines. They are not intelligent. It's just by trial and error. What does fine tuning mean here? Um, just changing hyperparameters like um, the weights, the biases, the optimizer, the learning rates. Um, so when, when you change the weights, you don't necessarily know what it means by right? what results you have. It is a big black box and it's kind of art to uh, how to build your networks. So. So, so, I mean, one of the things that, that I would see here is you have a very large base of possible solutions that you could do. And a very good one is, of course, one that absolutely does not fit to what the other side is expecting or trained to. So, so I, would, I, would, I would think that by, by adding or changing hyperparameters, what you basically influence is what kind of the solution space is, is preferred to be looked at yeah. at some point. So yeah, because this this must be huge. I mean, this, you see this degrees of freedom. What these what these figures can do is enormous. Yeah. So the best attack would be, of course, to to just sample all of it and see what what is the best one. But you can't do this. So probably by by changing the hyperparameters, you can have. Um, you can you can help uh, uh, to to find the best solution space in some sense. I, I have a strong analogy view of this for uh, base space sampling, for instance, or in general, semantic sampling. What you're doing with Q learning 
is essentially you sample a large space with random steps that the same thing as Monte Carlo methods do, mm -hmm. yes. essentially. Yes. So, and then you um, take the opponent, and the opponent suddenly goes into a state which you haven't discovered yet. And suddenly the neural network doesn't know what to do. Yeah. So, it reacts with the standard configuration. Or yeah, something like that, something, some fallback. So, as soon as you are in an unknown state which you haven't Monte Carlo sampled somehow, which I would say is it's like that. At least, um, then you um, then you simply have to put a default action in there or react to it somehow. Because I guess all those things you see are inference uh, simulations. This isn't actually when they learn something. Or no, it's not uh, during learning. It's during um, evaluation. So they okay. don't learn in this. Yeah. Scenario, yeah. they just, just fight each other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and even then, and even then, I mean, what you can basically do is that the that the uh, 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 opponent selects some new area in in solution space, and then the only reaction you can possibly do is by saying, okay, now I know this new area because I've just seen it, and I could then learn around this area, but of course. It, as the solution space is really huge, you can still choose another position, you know, and you're always a few steps behind. And you're not you're not really sampling the whole solution space because you're getting um, because you have a loss function there which will guide you in a certain direction in your solution solution space. This is by the this is also a very interesting optimization technique about where uh, you're not Supposed to be. Yes. It's, it's yes. like the, the, the opposite of a, of a good sampling. It's, <laughs> it's a bad sampling for the yes. other. <laughs> <laughs> so that means. I was curious if these optimum control methods are they being applied in, in this, in um, reinforcement learning? But there is this, you just talking about this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there is like an well, it's more a mathematical concept. I, I know it from quantum mechanics that you want to achieve a certain state of your system. Mm -hmm. And so, and then that's the result you want to achieve. And the question you ask is what external field do you need to apply to achieve that mm -hmm. result? Mm -hmm. So, I wonder if you can translate those concepts to reinforcement learning. I think here the problem is that also the opponent is learning, so it's changing. It's um, so in that case, you have mathematical information. You have, yeah, there's a yeah. math built around this that tells you how to optimize. But there will be a function that in this case it's not a function, it's discrete. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but okay. it's, it's very, very interesting. Okay, yeah, and that's. That's it for today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much for listening and for being here for the first paper reading group. <laughs> Thanks.